All right, welcome everyone to uh, a tribute for justice. Uh, we are celebrating and honoring of a towering Floridian, Justice Joseph Hatchett, who was so memorable in so many ways, but was a man who was exemplified by his, his ethical approach and his determination to changing the justice system. And he did that. So today, thank you to our sponsors, the U.F. Smathers Libraries, in particular, uh, Dean Judy Russell and Jim Cusick, the Levin College of Law Center for Governmental Responsibility, and African American Studies. But all of these groups, and two in particular, came together under the Nelson Initiative for Ethics and Leadership. Uh, that is a program at the University of Florida, which brings us together around topics like this, as offered classes before, and in the future will continue to bring people together on the topics of ethics and leadership. And we're fortunate today to have the inspiration for the Nelson Initiative with us. Uh, that is Bill Nelson, who himself is a historic and iconic figure in Florida politics, has served in the legislature, the cabinet, as U.S. Senator, and is now serving our nation as administrator of NASA. Bill, thank you so much for your inspiration and thank you for joining us today. Bill. Hey, hey John, and thank you uh, so much. Uh, you and Judy Russell have been the real spark plugs uh, behind getting this initiative uh, off the ground. Uh, we've had several programs, and then uh, suddenly I was called back to public service. Uh, and fortunately, uh, by means of uh, technology, we're able to continue it going. And I might mention uh, we're going to have a program. I'm bringing about eight astronauts to the University of Florida next April. And uh, we're going to do a program on astronauts and leadership and the future of the space program. This initiative on ethics and leadership is meant to train and inspire the next generation of lawyers and leaders and Floridians. Uh, most of us in the spirit of this initiative believe that a public office is a public trust. And if ever there's been someone whose life has personified that principle, it's Justice Joe Hatchett. He was born and raised in Clearwater. His father was a fruit picker. His mother was a maid. He attended segregated schools. When he was a student at Pinellas High School, a mentor told him that, that the future of the civil rights movement would be decided by lawyers. And the light bulb went off. And that was the moment that Judge Hatchett decided to study law. He took the bar exam, as so many of us did, in a Miami hotel back then. But he was only allowed to take the test there. He couldn't stay there because he was black. Uh, cooperating attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, he was. Judge Hatchett defended 50 civil rights cases, and he used to do it every day. And he knew that he was going to lose most of them. But what he said was that winning the case was not the object. The object was to create a record. Well, he really created a record. And less than two decades after he took the bar, Governor Askew appointed Judge Hatchett to the Florida Supreme Court. He was the first African-American to serve on the state's highest court. And it was groundbreaking. It was trailblazing. It was pioneering. Justice Hatchett inspired a generation of black students to study the law. 1979, Justice Hatchett became Judge Hatchett 
on the fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. He was the first African-American to serve in a federal circuit that covered the South at the time. And he was a towering champion for civil rights and justice. And if he had to stand alone to stand on the right side of history, you know, Judge Hatchett would. Judge Hatchett lived by the ethical precepts which have historically guided the conduct of, you think about it, truly great judges and lawyers of our past and present. You think about the man who appointed him to the Supreme Court of Justice, Governor Reuben Askew. You talk about ethical, he walked and talked ethics. And our state and society is better because of Judge Hatchett. So I want to thank you all for attending this event. Thank you for honoring a giant of the judiciary. Thank you very much, Bill. We are very fortunate because of our skill of our UF libraries that we will be able to hear from Judge Hatchett in his own voice. Two years ago, Judge Hatchett with Rosemary Barquette, whom I will introduce in a minute, uh, came to our campus, uh, had a conversation, and we recorded it. So uh, now uh, Jim Cusick, who is a cura curator of the special collections of the Smathers Library, and also happens to be president of the Florida Historical Society, uh, will introduce these clips and you'll have a chance to see Judge Hatchett speak in his own words. Um, thank you, John. Uh, and I, I'm a former president, no longer president of, of the Historical Society, but... That's um, historic. Um, <laughs> but in, the, um, in 2017, I had the great privilege to participate in an oral history that we did with uh, Judge Joseph Hatchett and with Judge Rosemary Barquette. And at that same time, they gave a public program. Uh, and we're now going to hear from Judge Hatchett in his own voice uh, in a few clips from that program. Um, and in our first clip, uh, he uh, talks about what Senator Nelson referred to about his early interest in the law, why he became interested in the law, uh, and how he pursued his degree in the law. So I will start with that. Yes. Clear water. Yes, I didn't come from Mexico. I came from Florida, Clearwater. <laughs> Everyone here knows where that is, I'm sure. Uh, of course, I was born in 1932, so everything was segregated. I finished the public schools in Pinellas County. I played in the high school band. Then I wanted to play in the Florida a &M Marching 100 band, so I chose Florida a &M University nice. for undergraduate school. But while in, in high school, my civics teacher, uh, well, we had a, a, a discussion about America and what was going to happen in America. And he convinced several of us that what was going to change in race relations in Florida and across the nation would be brought about by lawyers and courts. And about that time, I hadn't decided upon anything. Anyway, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer. The only problem is, of course, I had to go to college, so I went to Florida A&M, and this was also the time of the draft. So I was in college on deferments and a member of ROTC. So upon graduation in 1954, I received a degree in political science and also a commission in the United States Army as a second lieutenant. Spent 18 months in West Germany while it was a divided country and they applied to Harvard Law School and was accepted. Uh, this was before the LSAT. <laughs> uh, most people got into law school in those days. I guess that's why I got in. But in any event, I wanted to go to Howard, not just because it was the nearest law school I could get into, but because it was the pre preeminent civil rights law school in the country. After all, it was the place where Justice Thurgood Marshall had studied and he was then, at that time, general counsel of the NAACP, 
and I'd heard that he walked the campus and was in the hallways of that law school. So I went there and in 1959 finished, uh, got a degree from Howard. Then came to Daytona Beach uh, to work with a lawyer there named Horace Hill, who was a prominent civil rights lawyer there. You may recall that that's the lawyer that bought the Hawkins case that went to the Supreme Court of the United States and to the Florida Supreme Court three times. So I joined him in that practice, then finally moved out into my own practice. Uh, while I was doing primarily sit-ins and uh, protests and representing sit-ins, uh, the Justice Department came up with a program called Patterns and Practice Cases. That is, if you were to file a case against a discriminator who had a chain, you could ask the Justice Department to intervene. Well, I filed several of those lawsuits, and finally I did ask the Justice Department to intervene in one of those cases. And uh, that brought me in touch with Justice Department lawyers. We worked together for two or three years. They said, well, you should really reconsider working with the Justice Department. So I did that and became an assistant United States attorney in Jacksonville. And in two years, I became chief assistant United States attorney for the Middle District of Florida. Congress then passed the U.S. Magistrates Act. So I became the first magistrate judge in the Middle District of Florida. And uh, that's where Governor Ruben Askew found me when he appointed me to the Florida Supreme Court. I stayed on the floor. Can you turn the mic? Oh, yeah. You can do it from the back. Um, we have a second clip from slightly later in that program. And, um, and as you heard the Senator say before, uh, Judge Hatchett was involved with the NAACP uh, defending civil rights demonstrators, uh, often 50 cases a day. Uh, and we'll try and do Uh, you were, uh, you wanted to go to law school to make a difference. Right. You went to Howard because that was a focal point of people who were making. You got to see uh, the Chief Justice walk the, walk the halls. Now, and you told us, you went out and to me, one of the things that I think uh, is one of the great messages I got from you is you, in handling those civil rights cases, expected to lose. Yes. So you handled case after case after case. Sometimes Some, 50 a day. Sometimes 50 a day. Yes. And you expected to lose. Yes. Because in taking the long view, you thought ultimately you get there. And the parenthetical is, of course, not only did you get there, you were judging those cases and you were helping to implement Brown versus Board. Yes. Well, I was a cooperating attorney with the Legal Defense Fund. The Legal Defense Fund only had in New York about five lawyers. So they took uh, lawyers all over the United States, primarily Howard Law graduates, and uh, put us into a body called Cooperating Attorneys. And we would meet with the staff attorneys from the NAACP to be educated on the kind of issues that the fund wanted to bring before the appellate courts, especially the United States Supreme Court. All of us who were cooperating attorneys knew we were not going to win on sit-ins and uh, because clearly the Florida law was against uh, trespass. And uh, our demonstrators were trespassing. They were assembling. They were doing a lot of things that the law uh, prohibited. So winning the case was not the, the object. The object was to make a record that would someday get to a court where the judges or justices of that court would hold those laws unconstitutional. So it was a matter of building a record rather than winning. 
So I would start in St. Augustine and lose three cases. They were easy. To, we could try them in 30 minutes because if I had six demonstrators and they sat in at a lunch counter and took one police officer to give enough testimony to convict all of them, and uh, we had no evidence to the contrary. We did go in. We did sit down. We were asked to leave. We did not leave. You're guilty. So that would take about 30 minutes. I'd go back to Titusville and do another 30 or 20 in Coco and down to Melbourne and end up at the end of the day with 50 lost cases. But in some of those cases, I would get in pretty good constitutional arguments. Judge, I want to... And in our final clip, uh, a little bit later in the program, uh, both Judge Rosemary Barquette and Judge Joseph Hackett were asked their opinion of what the role of the courts is in the United States, and we're now going to hear their responses. Uh, what do you think it means to be a judge? What was what is the what is uh, the value of a judge and its role, the role of a judge in the American system? Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> well, obviously, the, you know, the first level, the first cut at this is you want a neutral decider, someone who is going to evaluate both sides of a case and render an impartial and a fair judgment after assuring that there has been a fair process. Um, but there's much more to it, ideally, in the American system in that the court has the obligation of assuring that the Constitution is obeyed as vis-a-vis -vis the legislature uh, or the Congress because um, the, the, the beauty for me of, of this whole system of checks and balances and the judiciary as an independent third branch of government is that the legislature represents the majority. That's the, the essence of what the legislative body is supposed to do. And so when they represent the majority, there are times when the majority wants to do things to oppress uh, a, a minority of its citizens. And so the court sits as the um, protector of minority rights. I mean, that's what it's supposed to do by assuring that the constitutional rights of, of individuals and, and minorities specifically are protected against the inroads of a majoritarian government which may want to suppress those rights. So in our system, we have that obligation, and I think that, to me, is the, the greatest fulfillment of public service as a, as a judge when you can attempt to make sure that minority rights are protected in accordance with what the founders of this democracy uh, intended. Judge? I agree with Judge Barquet 100 percent. A short way of saying it, I think, is that judges are called upon to interpret the Constitution and interpret the laws of the country or the state. And in doing that, you accomplish all of the things she's talked about. Thank you, Jim, for allowing us to have that opportunity to hear, to hear the judge in his own words. Now let me introduce the commentators that are going to uh, tell, tell us a little more about their perspective on the judge's life, his cases, and his background. First, Judge Rosemary Barquette, whom you've already met, uh, who is herself, herself a historic figure, uh, the first uh, female chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court, also a member of the 11th Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, and currently a judge at the U.S. Claims Tribunal in The Hague. Also, she happens to be a UF graduate. We're very proud of that. Also on our panel is Professor Denea Wright. She is a Sessoms Professor of Law at UF, a nationally renowned scholar in legal history, constitutional law, and has recently written a lot on the ERA. Uh, 
that has been uh, acclaimed nationwide. Professor Kenneth Nunn is the Dr. Hilliard Nunn Racial Justice Professor, a nationally recognized scholar in civil rights, race relations, and he is the co-founder of the Center for the Study of Race and Race Relations. Uh, Dean Judy Russell of the UF Libraries is an organizing force uh, for all of these programs and uh, someone who I've just enjoyed working with and I appreciate Judy so much. She will uh, summarize uh, this program at the end. And so we will begin now by asking Judge Barquette, will you please tell us uh, a little bit about your experience with, with, with Judge Hatchett? Uh, excuse me. Oh, I have to, I think I've unmuted myself, have I? I hope I have. Uh, Anyway, I, you know, I was struck, I, I've spoken about Judge Hatchett on earlier occasions, and I, I was struck when, um, when Senator Nelson called him a giant, which he was, but in juxtaposition to the way I saw him, it just makes you realize that a lot of times when you think of a giant, you think of somebody flamboyant, somebody larger than life, somebody, um, you know, just barging into places and things. And Joe wasn't like that, which was amazing to me because having suffered through all the things he suffered and, and you know, when, when you say things like he tried maybe 50 cases in a day or a couple of days and expected to lose all of them, you, it, it's too facile just to dismiss that experience with just one sentence because I don't, I mean, all of many of us on this uh, in this room, uh, virtual room, uh, have been lawyers, and we know how abusive sometimes being in uh, being a lawyer in a courtroom can be. And so he had to suffer that over and over and over again. And yet, the the one defining characteristic that I've always seen in Joe is his amazing calmness in the face of injustice. And I, I, it's, it's something I've tried really hard to emulate. I'm not very good at it. It certainly wasn't as good as Joe was. Um, he, 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 his, his tenure as chief judge was not all that easy. Uh, he fought for getting us additional judges on the 11th Circuit, which we should have had, and yet he had opposition from his own court on that. And it, he, he just didn't let anything deter him. Uh, the, 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 the concept of perseverance was essentially his. Perseverance and calmness and dedication and gentleness but at the same time, never giving up on the principles that he believed in and, uh, and really fought for, when I say fought for, fought for with persuasion, but with calmness and with gentleness, but never giving up on it. I, he, he was an amazing uh, role model. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nunn? get connected here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, John. Appreciate the uh, opportunity here uh, to say a few words about uh, what everyone says, and I would agree is a giant of a man, uh, Judge Joseph Hatchett. Um, I had the good pleasure of meeting him on a number of occasions. Um, I can't say we were good friends, but, um, you know, it was a pleasure every time that I did. And I think the most significant of those occasions was one time I was at the ABA conference and they had a little bus that would take you from one location to the next. And I got on the bus and I think I was a young uh, law professor here at the University of Florida. I hadn't uh, been here that long. And uh, Judge Hatchett was on the bus and he was seating, seated and he beckoned to me, come on over. So I went, uh, beckoned me to sit down, so I did. And immediately I knew who he was. 
And I was surprised to found out, found, find out that he knew who I was too. So he says, oh, you're that uh, young guy at the University of Florida now. I said, yeah, how do you like it? He started asking me questions about that and about you know, my life and kind of why did I come down to University of Florida. Um, and so it was quite pleasant that here's a guy who at that time, I don't, I don't think he was chief justice, but he was already on the 11th circuit uh, you know, a, a, a appellate federal judge paying attention to some guy who's probably wet behind the ears and just fresh more or less out of law school, hadn't done anything of note, but it was just, you know, his, uh, his way that he was a, you know, he's an open person. Uh, he was very nice, uh, very uh, unassuming in, in the way that he would talk to people, um, you know, like, uh, Judge Barquette said, you know, he wasn't the kind of person who, you know, was like, you know, real uh, effervescent person. You know, he was just, uh, you know, just a, a very calm and more or less quiet person. But as you can see from these interviews, he's a man of superior intelligence, thoughtful jurist who cared very much about the rule of law and the role of courts in society. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, because what he said was uh, the, the uh, role of a court is to interpret the Constitution and the laws. And to do so in a way that makes you the protector of the rights of the minority or of uh, disadvantaged people in society, people who otherwise don't have that. But what I would say is beyond that, I mean, so, so basically that kind of lines up, you know, kind of the way that uh, one of the uh, current Supreme Court uh, justices, I think it's the chief justice, said that lawyers are supposed to, not lawyers, judges are supposed to call balls and strikes. Hear me? Uh, I'm on a Zoom. I'm on a call. I'm hearing That's some fine. other uh, commentary here, but I, hopefully I'm, uh, I'm still okay. Uh, but I think he went beyond that. What, what Judge uh, Hatchett was to me is the, the, the preeminent example of what I would call a culturally responsive judge. He was also a culturally responsive lawyer before he became a judge, but he's what I would call a culturally responsive judge. What I mean, what do I mean by that? So Judge Hatchett was not an originalist. But he was someone who held to Thurgood Marshall's belief that the Constitution was a living document. And that document needed to change in order for our society to change. <clears throat> he, as you heard, had a background and a commitment in civil rights enforcement and civil rights litigation. And that commitment was something that he brought with him to the bench. He believed that the role of the court, as we said, was to enhance the rights of those who were disempowered. And certainly to enforce sort of a new regime of civil rights and make the Constitution what the Constitution should have been in the outset was part and parcel of what he was trying to do with his jurisprudence at that point in time. Now, in that way, he was an heir of Thurgood Marshall in the same way that A. Leon, Judge A. Leon Higginbotham uh, from the Cir Second Circuit was a uh, heir of uh, Thurgood Marshall. In the same way that Damon Keith Judge Damon Keith was an heir of Thurgood Marshall. Judge Harry Edwards from the DC Circuit was uh, heir of, of Thurgood Marshall. And Judge Nathaniel Jones, I think it's the Fourth Circuit, wherever it is, Ohio, I'm not sure, but uh, he, he also kind of fit that group. So these are all giants. These are all giants. What made them giants? They were people who followed after we had the litigation from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to open up the doors of desegregation in elementary schools and in uh, colleges and law schools around the country. They were the people who benefited from that. 
And they were the people who became lawyers and judges in the 60s and the 70s and then moved on to the bench and were charged with the responsibility of implementing that which was the fruit of the labors of Thurgood Marshall when he was with the NAACP. So, uh, so one comment I want to make uh, about uh, Judge Hatchett what, refers to his retirement, and it has to do with his retirement speech. In his retirement speech, Judge Hatchett said that he was, quote, an affirmative action baby, and that he was proud of that fact and always would be. Now, that's a quite a phrase to be made, and I believe it was uh, 2000, yeah, when he retired, 1999, I believe, when he retired. That's a heck of a phrase to make because that was when affirmative action baby was being bandied about as a pejorative phrase by many in the pundit class. That was something you weren't supposed to be. Judge proudly claimed that mantle, which one would wonder, well, why would he do that? Because he really was not the result of affirmative action, at least not in the school sense, because we know that he went to FAMU, we know he went to Howard, these were uh, historically black institutions, and he was not sort of part of that wave of integration that would be occasioned by affirmative action. Why would he call himself that? Well, what he's talking about is his appointment to the Florida Supreme Court by Judge Askew, I mean, uh, Governor Askew. He's talking about the fact that Jimmy Carter put him on the Fifth Circuit later uh, after the split, the Eleventh Circuit. So what he's saying is that I came from a particular community, and I saw it as important for me to take advantage of an opportunity when it was offered and to use that opportunity to lay tracks and build bridges so that people behind me can come through. He wasn't thinking, oh, well, I need to be concerned about my own individual progress, my own individual merit, my own uh, you know, right to claim this position that I now have. He saw it as a collective. He said, look, this is the culture I come from. This is my community. I need to make sure that now that I have this opportunity, I can do something with that. In the same way that the, the, the whole theory behind affirmative action is that if you gave someone a chance from marginalized communities that they could come in and do as this, this uh, uh, graphic in front of me that you can't see that, that has words from Chesterfield Smith, uh, the, the, the great uh, uh, ABA president and lawyer uh, graduate at the University of Florida who said, you have to go out and do good. He wanted to do good uh, for his uh, community and for the nation. So uh, basically what he did was make sure that that opportunity was available uh, for other people. This is work that he continued when he left the bench, when he went to Ackerman Center Fit, uh, you know, he continued his efforts representing civil rights plaintiffs. Uh, there was litigation that took place around one, not one Florida, but um, uh, Ward Connolly, when he came to the state of Florida, uh, wanting to have a ballot initiative to uh, reduce uh, opportunities in education, opportunities in government contracting for uh, people of color and women. Uh, he took on clients, which were civil rights firms, and litigated their cause uh, and uh, helped to get the courts to say that that ballot initiative was not appropriate here in the state of Florida. We got rid of it, as, as I uh, intimated, uh, ultimately the governor uh, push through this one Florida act. And so we, we wound up where we wound up. But a lot of kind of political push in a, a particular uh, direction that was going on back in, you know, sort of the late 1990s, early 2000. And he was prepared to stand up and fight against that uh, at that 
that point. Uh, also, while he was on the bench, while he was in the 11th Circuit, uh, there were many times that all of these weighty issues in the South that ultimately worked their way up to the Supreme Court, but began here in the South, in district courts here in the South, and then went to the 11th Circuit. Issues in relationship to affirmative action, for example, and it's uh, you know, it's a legitimacy, voting rights, redistricting, and in relationship to redistricting, in fact, you may not know that the judge was a special master uh, in a uh, Georgia redistricting case where he brought some of his expertise and helped the, the Georgia courts redistrict uh, you know, in, in a proper constitutional fashion, and his expertise was wanted because of that. School desegregation, employment discrimination, and in fact, the death penalty. Uh, many of you who were law students who, um, you know, read about the death penalty in our law books, you know about the McCleskey case, McCleskey v. Kemp. Uh, he was one of the judges who heard that case on the 11th Circuit before it went to the Supreme Court in dissent. He thought it was significant that this case showed that African Americans were more likely to receive the death penalty. There's a clip that you don't get, you didn't get, of him talking about the death penalty in this uh, uh, session he had sitting here uh, in this room at the University of Florida College of Law. But he says, oh, he wasn't that concerned about the death penalty. He was an old prosecutor. He was, he was you know, happy to see people get the, the sentences that they, they deserve. But in, he did not want to see the death penalty imposed in a, 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 a racially uh, improper way. And so he uh, was a dissenter in that case. Uh, and that was kind of fit with his whole way of doing uh, the protection of individual rights 